it's that time of year again, meaning way too late in the year to be doing a Top Movies of 2022 video, but you guys know me. I take forever to make stuff. But at the very least, 2022 turned out to be a really great year for movies. So much so that we're doing a top 15 instead of a top 10 this time, so I can give a few more movies than usual the spotlight they deserve. But as usual, let's list off some honorable mentions that I feel are still very much worth a watch. Men, Barbarian, Eon, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, Petite Maman, The Menu, Bodies, 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 Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, The House, The Black Phone, Two Leslie, Top Gun Maverick, After Yang, All That Breathes, Armageddon Time, We're All Going to the World's Fair, The Fablemans, God's Creatures, Jackass Forever, The Batman, Vortex, X, RRR, and Women Talking. Okay, number 15, Mad God. Mad God is a stop-motion abstract horror film written and directed by Phil Tippett. If you don't know the name, I promise you, you know this man's work. Phil Tippett is a veteran in the field of stop motion, having been one of the heads of ILM animation. You've seen his work in Star Wars, Robocop, and Jurassic Park, in which he has the eternally hilarious credit of Dinosaur Supervisor. Tippett began making Mad God all the way back in 1990, but when Spielberg decided to go the CGI route for the visual effects in Jurassic Park, Tippett became discouraged about the future of stop motion. He shelved Mad God after famously exclaiming, I've become extinct. But thanks to Kickstarter and a ton of hardworking animators, Mad God was finally completed after 30 years. Mad God follows the journey of a faceless protagonist as they traverse an apocalyptic hellscape of pure unending suffering and buddy, it's pretty neat. This film is an immersive, unrelenting nightmare, with many sequences that have remained burned into my brain ever since my first watch. The narrative is very simple. We are, for the most part, seeing this world through the eyes of the assassin, as he's called in the credits, as he descends further into this dangerous world, seemingly on a mission to destroy it. Less of a plot, more of an allegory for the pain, suffering, and exploitation of the innocent. Most filmmakers go, listen, we're living in a society. But then Phil Tippett is like, no, we're living in hell. And then I'm like, yes. The animation, of course, is beautifully done, and the detail and vastness of the production design creates this sense of immersion and scale that only stop motion can convey. I honestly can't picture this film being as effective in any other medium. The puppets, models, and sets are so tangible and real, and each creature design is more beautifully grotesque than the next. And somehow, as relentlessly upsetting as this film is, there still manages to be a few little humorous moments here and there couple sneaky funny parts. Overall, it's definitely a tough one emotionally. Prepare yourself for that going in, but if you're down to watch some deep dark stuff, I think Mad God is definitely worth your time. You're not extinct, Phil. You did it. We love you. Keep making stuff. Number 14, You Won't Be Alone. You Won't Be Alone, written and directed by Goran Stilevsky, follows the life of a young girl, Nevena who is kidnapped by a witch on her 16th birthday and transformed into one herself. Nevena, having been hidden away in a cave for most of her life in order to prevent this particular witch from finding her, is now experiencing the outside world for the very first time. She also doesn't have the ability to speak, so we hear her inner thoughts as a narration, a narration that is very innocent and childlike because of her limited understanding of the world around her. One of the powers these witches possess is the ability to shapeshift, to take on the identity of an existing person or animal upon their death. So we see multiple actors playing Nevena throughout the film as she becomes more and more in touch with her own humanity by stepping into the lives of others. Despite the many instances of violence and horror in this film, it's surprisingly compassionate. Even though we're shown a lot of cruelty, a lot of tragedy, I found the overall tone to be a hopeful one. Every actor that plays Nevena does such an excellent and consistent job. Her transition from person to person feels so seamless. Everyone was just so on the same page with this that you never for a second get the impression that that's not her in there. The excellent cinematography by Matthew Chong plays as huge a role in conveying the experience of our main character as her narration does. Since she's experiencing many things others take for granted, and for the very first time, everything becomes heightened. Every touch, every sight, every little sensory experience becomes sacred. Vast, beautiful locations, lots of natural light that gives an ethereal quality to many of the scenes. An unusual, unexpected love letter to just existing, just being around. And I thought it was beautifully done. Number 13, Resurrection. 
Resurrection was written and directed by Andrew Siemens and is about a successful single mother whose past comes back to haunt her in the worst way possible. This is one of those films that I went in knowing nothing about and I think that's the best way to watch this one so I'll be as vague as I can as far as the plot goes. I will say that I found this to be quite a good companion piece to 1944's Gaslight, which is a film I wish more people watched considering how the term gaslighting derived from this very film is thrown around on the internet these days, oftentimes incorrectly. You see, gaslighting isn't just lying or having a different recollection of events than somebody else. It's like the real evil stuff, a whole campaign to make you go nuts. Like in the film Gaslight, the husband is turning lights down, he's taking stuff off the walls, making a bunch of noise in the attic so that when Ingrid Bergman mentions anything about it, he can be like, oh, ew, that didn't happen. Oh, it looks like somebody needs to go to the lady hospital. Gaslighting is intentionally making someone question their sanity through a pretty elaborate campaign of tomfoolery, okay? It's not just regular lying. It's pretty involved. It's a whole thing. And Resurrection, I felt, was a great modern horror take on this very insidious type of abuse. Rebecca Hall's performance as the main character, Margaret, is outstanding, as is Tim Roth's in the role of a very creepy boy. Being immersed in the trauma from her past, Margaret deteriorates and regresses throughout the film, and Hall does a great job portraying that. There's a monologue that she delivers in this that provides a lot of context for what's going on, but is also so riveting, you cannot take your eyes off of her. I don't know if I was able to take a breath the entire time she was talking. Overall, this is such a well-paced little psychological horror thriller that you might not take a breath the entire film, actually. Number 12, The Innocents. The Innocence is a Norwegian supernatural thriller written and directed by Eskil Vaught. The story follows a group of young children who have varying degrees of telekinetic ability. And the more time these kids spend around one another, the further these special powers develop. But sadly, one of these kids turns out to be a real maniac, and his violent disposition becomes so sinister that everyone in his immediate vicinity is unknowingly at risk. Convincing child performances seem to be almost as hard to come by as children who are actually convincingly written in the first place. So having almost the entirety of this film rest on the shoulders of these young characters played by such young actors was a tall order and they absolutely nailed it. The way the powers that these children have are handled is so grounded in reality that you believe every moment. Vod clearly has an understanding of how children behave and interact, so when these children begin to share their powers with one another in play, it feels absolutely authentic. The suspension of disbelief requires no heavy lifting on the viewer's part. You're basically like, yeah, that's probably how this would happen. I love a good character study, and it's rare that you see any about children because, again, having good writing and convincing child performances can be like lightning in a bottle. I went into this film not really knowing what to expect and probably leaning towards the fear that they might fumble this premise like so many other films have. I certainly didn't expect a devastating character study about the development of empathy in human beings. The film expertly performs this balancing act of portraying the joy of constant discovery that one has as a child while maintaining this looming sense of dread throughout. The cinematography and sound design just come together to create this beautifully off-kilter atmosphere. Just such a sharply executed little film that came out of nowhere, so I am so grateful that I caught this one. Number 11, Bones and All. Speaking of strange little films that flawlessly execute a bizarre premise, Luca Guadagnino just, he just doesn't miss, you know? Bones and All is an adaptation of the novel of the same name, and it's a coming-of-age road trip love story about cannibals, because of course it is. But don't let that little detail about eating people make you think this is anything less than the sweetest, most touching love story of the year. And sure, thanks to the sound design and practical effects, it is so legitimately grotesque at points that even the most desensitized horror fan is gonna have trouble with this, but also, grow up, because it's really good. Guadagnino does romance like nobody else, and has proven to be quite the horror guy too, so this project just had his name written all over it from the start. All of his strengths as a director are well represented here. The basic story is a teenage girl named Marin is abandoned by her father after the burden of her cannibalistic impulses becomes too much for him to bear. She's left with just enough information to be able to find her birth mother whom she has known nothing about up to this point, and with the hope that perhaps her mother may be like her, she hits the road in an attempt to find her. On the road, she meets other eaters, as they call themselves in this film, one of whom is a boy around her age named Lee. Lee, who has been out on his own for quite a while, agrees to help Marin reach her destination, and the two fall in love along the way. 
The way cannibalism is portrayed in this film is just otherworldly enough to inspire the empathy necessary to stay with these characters throughout the story. There's a vampiric quality to them in the sense that this is not something that they have a tremendous amount of control over, and there's a certain amount of guilt that comes with what they have to do. They basically are what they are and they're just making the best of it. At least when it comes to Marin and Lee, there's some other cannibals in this that take things absolutely too far. Every single performance in this is great. Taylor Russell and Timothy Chalamet just fit their roles so well and what they have is beyond just good chemistry. They have this ease and comfort with each other that just comes across as effortless on screen. Mark Rylance in the supporting role of Sully is one of the most interesting performances I saw in 2022. This character is meant to be a bit of an enigma for most of the film and the choices Rylance makes are so perfectly bizarre. What a unique presence this man has. What a gift. This is one of those adaptations that differs quite a bit from the source material in all the right ways. The book and the film are both excellent, and even though a lot of the story beats are the same, they are overall entirely different experiences, both of which I would highly recommend. Number 10, Athena. Okay, listen, whatever you're planning on watching today, whatever you're watching right now, literally, this video, from the bottom of my heart, Get that ball off the TV! Athena is what you need to be watching. Directed by Romain Gavras, this thing knocked my socks off, blew my hair back, my soul left my body, my cat started doing weird things, and then I passed out. With Matthias Picard at the helm, this film had the most impressive cinematography of the year, period. By the end of the opening sequence, I was like, is the cameraman okay? Spoilers, he isn't. I tell you, I'm I mean, sure, the crew's fine now, but Jesus. These aren't just impressive long takes. These are intricately choreographed action sequences with a ton of moving parts and an unreal amount of extras within impressively long takes. Having watched the behind the scenes several times, I am no closer to understanding how they managed to pull this thing off. Story-wise, this is a classic brother against brother Greek tragedy if I've ever seen one. Basically, the youngest of four brothers has been murdered. Utterly grief-stricken, one brother believes the cops are responsible and begins an all-out war with them. Another is working directly with the cops and doesn't believe they're responsible. And brother number three is a complete scumbag who's only out for himself. Chaos ensues, leading to an ending that I have not stopped thinking about for an entire year. It's brother against brother, it's the people against the cops, it's cameraman against filing cabinet. What else can I say? Ah! Number nine, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. I think the film that exceeded my expectations the most in 2022 was definitely Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. I just wasn't sure how this internet short was gonna translate into feature length, but oh my God. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On lives in an Airbnb with his Nana Connie, both of whom have been accidentally separated from the rest of their family when the former human residents moved out. When a documentarian named Dean, played by the director Dean Fleischer Camp, begins renting the place, he begins interviewing and filming Marcel. These interviews become incredibly popular online, giving Marcel the hope that his newfound notoriety can help him find his family. This film has probably my favorite production design of 2022. Each environment, each tiny contraption is crafted with such creativity, such detail that you absolutely believe Marcel and his grandmother have made all of these things themselves. It creates this beautiful bridge between the parts of the film that exist in stop motion and the parts of the film that are live action. Jenny Slate and Dean Fleischer Camp worked on this thing meticulously for about seven years and it shows. One of my fears going into this was that even though the improvisational nature of the original YouTube shorts were hilarious and adorable, at feature length, that could easily feel as though it's overstayed its welcome. But thank God, the way that this was written prioritizes story and emotional core over everything else. The improvisation is there to create a level of authenticity to these characters and not some crutch to sort of just edit around. The performances by Jenny Slate as Marcel and Isabella Rossellini as Nana Connie are the kind that make you just so sad that there aren't many mainstream award ceremonies that include a vocal performance award. These two characters feel so authentic, you forget that you're watching these two little shells and it's just about a boy and his grandma. Phenomenal work by both of them. I cannot say enough about the realism that they brought to this. Marcel as a character isn't just there to be cute and funny. He is so fully formed that you empathize with him every step of the way. This story could have been easily a sappy, heavy-handed film about family that we've seen a million times, but they don't take the easy way out and thank God 
God. Marcel's themes of loss, transition, loneliness, and finding your sense of self are approached with such honesty. And I know it's cliche to say something has a lot of heart, but it fits in this case. It has heart, it has soul, and it has shoes on. What else could you want? Number eight, Pearl. Listen, X was fun. It was well executed. It was a good time. Pearl was cinema. Pearl was written and directed by Ty West and also co-written by Mia Goth and is the prequel to X where we get the backstory of that old lady that was wreaking havoc on all those porn stars. In the same way that X was heavily inspired by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and just has that overall 70s horror aesthetic, Pearl is basically the direction The Wizard of Oz would have gone if right at the end of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, Dorothy just snaps Toto's neck. And if that doesn't sell you on this, I, I don't know what will, but I'll keep going. Pearl takes place on the same farmland as X, but all the way back in 1918 when Pearl was a young newlywed. With her husband off fighting in the war, Pearl is stuck living under the thumb of her cruel, controlling mother. As she goes through her daily routine of chores on the farm, Pearl dreams of escaping her circumstances and becoming a star. A dream that feels more possible than ever when she finds out that they will be holding auditions for a traveling dance troupe nearby. Unfortunately, her lack of experience and humble upbringing aren't the only things holding her back. She also happens to be out of her f***ing mind. In the last couple years, Mia Goth has gone from that girl from that thing to, oh my god, I didn't know she had that in her. Her performance as Pearl isn't just a good performance. It isn't just a fun performance. It is so beautifully unhinged that I just didn't even bother picking up my jaw from the floor after a while. I, I just left it there. And I'm not talking about unhinged in the way of like, oh, it goes off the rails into bad acting territory. This is a pitch perfect execution of someone who is deeply unwell with a hefty enough pinch of camp to just make it such an uncomfortable joy to watch. This is one of those performances that has no vanity whatsoever. The Mia Goth that you know for being the fashionista who constantly looks as though she's ready for a Vogue photo shoot at a moment's notice is shed entirely in service of letting this character be the absolute gremlin of a baby person she needs to be. And even better, what makes this film truly great is the fact that Goth's performance is the highlight rather than the thing that has to carry it. While X is very one-to-one -one tonally and aesthetically with 70s slasher films, Pearl has a few different things going on, all of which complement one another quite well. The time period is 1918, but there's some like 1930s and 40s vibes going on with its romantically whimsical score. Shout out to Tyler Bates and Timothy Williams for a beautiful soundtrack, one of the best of the year for sure. And all the while, it still keeps some of that 1970s slasher feel, giving this film a personality all its own. Just an incredible psychotic romp with an end credit sequence, by the way, that's going to leave you not wanting to speak to anybody for like 24 hours. So just, just go ahead and call in sick. I don't know. Number seven, Nope. Nope is the third feature film written and directed by Jordan Peele, and boy am I glad I saw this in a theater. Nope follows the story of two siblings who, after the untimely death of their father, discover an unidentified flying object that's causing a number of strange occurrences on their property. In an attempt to catch this mysterious occurrence on video, OJ, played by Daniel Kaluuya, and Emerald, played by Kiki Palmer, find that this entity is far more dangerous than they could have anticipated. You've likely heard this film mentioned as one of the most baffling snubs at this year's Oscars, and for good reason. I personally thought the story was great, but even if that aspect of it didn't appeal to you, the film's technical elements are pretty undeniable. The cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytema is nothing short of awe-inspiring. Like I said, I am so grateful to have experience this for the first time in a theater. These low shots that accentuate the vastness of the sky and create the sense of scale were just breathtaking, especially on the big screen. The level of immersion you get by actually shooting the film on location is something I've missed so much from other big budget sci-fi in recent years. It adds so much more weight to these beautifully paced and choreographed action sequences, and it just felt like, oh, what do you call it? Help me out, Harry. You know, my favorite thing about the movie is like, it feels like a like a movie. Thank you. Some of the most frightening sound design I've heard in a while. There's this one scene in particular where something very bad is happening to a large group of people. If you've seen the film, you know exactly what I'm talking about, in which the sound design is legitimately bone chilling. The score by Michael Abels was just such a joy. He's worked on Peel's other two films as well, and the music he did for Nope is probably my favorite so far. It's like this combination of Indiana Jones era John Williams mixed with elements of soul and little touches here and there that give it the vibe of an old West 
Western. Really elevated all of these horror and action sequences and felt like a throwback to 80s and early 90s Spielberg. It just gives that feeling of like, oh, they just don't make them like this anymore. Great performances all around. Daniel Kaluuya is great, as always. He's playing a very introverted person in this film, which can be difficult without coming across as wooden a lot of the time. But being the skilled actor that he is, Kaluuya is able to convey a lot without having to say much at all. It just always comes across as effortless with him. Kiki Palmer in the role of his sister is playing his polar opposite and is just so charismatic and funny. What a year she's had. Between the success of this film, that Hot Ones clip of her that instantly became a meme. Mm. This one has a little sweetness to it and her viral Angela Bassett impression, she really just hit a home run in 2022. She and Kaluuya have this flawless sibling chemistry that gives this film such a solid emotional core. There's this little signal that the two characters give each other that's introduced early in the film, and then it's reincorporated later in a moment that is very climactic, and buddy, it gets me every time. Jordan Peele's three for three in my book. Great job, keep them coming. Number six, The Northmen. Speaking of three for three, my guy Robert Eggers hasn't missed yet. You know, people talk a lot of shit about that live action Lion King, but I'm like, hey, come on now. I like The Northman. The Northman is an adaptation of the original Norse legend from which Shakespeare's Hamlet was derived. And listen, I love Shakespeare as much as the next guy, but after experiencing the Viking version of this, Hamlet can take a walk. This was awesome. And before you go, oh, so this is basically Hamlet slash the Lion King hero's journey towards responsibility and or revenge, seen it. Okay, first of all, no you haven't. And second of all, Robert Eggers does not do normie stuff. How dare you? He takes the old revenge narrative and gives it the old Eggers special by making it an absolutely bananas masterpiece. Eggers' ongoing collaboration with his cinematographer Photographer Jaron Blaschke continues to impress. Absolutely beautiful shots of the landscape, really impressive camera work during that berserker raid scene, and they even brought back that orthochromatic filter they used in the lighthouse for some of the nighttime scenes. It cancels out all the red light, creating this high contrast black and white that's just incredibly striking. And contrary to what the director's commentary would have you believe, it's just a beautifully shot film throughout. I'm telling you, this film has all the Eggersisms we've come to love, from historical accuracy all the way over to absolutely eviscerating himself during the director's commentary. I know his chronic perfectionism is a huge part of what makes him great, but I hope he can just give himself a little pat on the back one day. Your films are good, Robert, I promise. The cast is absolutely stacked in this and there is not a weak performance in the bunch. Alexander Skarsgård gives a genuinely great performance in this, and I know a lot of the press about his role here was mostly surrounding how jacked he got for it, and yeah, sure. The shoulders alone are psychotic. Hats off to him and his trainer, A+, great job. But his performance really is genuinely moving. You feel the depth of his character's rage and despair, and it isn't all jumping from real high and facing the elements. There's a fragile boy under there. You just wanna grab a step stool and give him a hug. This film just has it all. Great performances, earth-shaking monologue by Nicole Kidman, berserkers, volcanoes, Norse mythology, a mini-boss fight to obtain an ancient blade, revenge, Viking lacrosse, fertility barbecue, and most importantly, Bjork. Come on now. Number five, everything, everywhere, all at once. Considering the sheer amount of discourse about this film since its Best Picture nomination and subsequent win, I will be as brief as I can. Get a load of this. It was a great movie before it won Best Picture, and it remains a great movie now that it's won Best Picture. If you've yet to see it, do not believe all of the recent talk about it being an Oscar bait, mediocre choice, blah, blah, blah. I don't like my favorite band anymore now that everybody knows about them. It has nothing to do with the film, and it's unfortunate that it sustained all of these injuries and the ongoing hot take wars. It's a great film, period. Shout out to the now famous watch it and have fun before Twitter tells you it's overrated letterbox review by Cosmonaut Markey for calling this out a full year ago. I know that the term instant classic is thrown around too much. Y you know, the thing that's usually impossible to gauge until the film is proven to have stood the test of time. The, oh my God, this is an instant classic feeling is something that does happen, but it's incredibly rare. I genuinely got that feeling the first time I saw this and in every rewatch since. This film is truly special, and it is absolutely worth your time. That's all I'm gonna say. Number four, decision to leave. Well, if it isn't Park Chan-wook making one of the best films of the year again. Look, 
I understand that maybe hearing too much about a certain director might make you sick of them before even giving them the time of day, especially when annoying people like myself will not knock it off with, oh my God, have you seen Old Boy? What about Old Boy? Boy, oh boy, you need to watch Old Boy. You'll often see this man's work on lists like most effed up movies of all time, 25 films that you can't watch more than once, top 10 films that made me move out of my house and then immediately move back in again, the number one film that made me fully go pee. And that's all well and good, but it can be a little reductive after a while. It can give the impression to those who have yet to experience Park Chan Wook's work that he's just some kind of edgelord. He probably wears sunglasses in the house because he's just an old boy after all. But when you get right down to it, this man is one of the greatest filmmakers working today and has been for the last 20 plus years. Decision to Leave is yet another testament to how refined his craft continues to be. This film follows the story of a detective as he investigates the sudden death of a mountain climber. It's unclear as to whether his death was due to a fall or due to foul play, so his widow falls under suspicion. While investigating her, the detective becomes infatuated, and if I say any more plot-wise, you'll never forgive me, and frankly, I'll never forgive myself. This very familiar framework of the detective and the femme fatale may feel daunting to watch because what am I going to get out of this genre at this point? What noir stone has possibly been left unturned? Turns out a lot of them, whole mountains you might say. And as much as it wears its Hitchcock influence on its fashionably buttoned sleeve, it manages to be entirely its own thing. Park Hae Il and Tang Wei give phenomenal performances. Both of them just have it, you know, just that presence. The camera loves them. Both actors are playing very reserved, closed off characters, so almost every interaction they have is like a tightrope walk. They choose their words very carefully, and so much is conveyed with just a glance, a gesture. I'm telling you, you cannot take your eyes off of either of them. Most of the scenes with these two are incredibly tense, with mountains of subtext floating just below the surface. There's also a slight language barrier between the two characters, where even though her Korean is really good, her first language is Chinese, so when she wants to really express herself, she uses a translation app. There are times when one doesn't know what the other one has said until they're able to read it or look up a certain word later, which adds a whole nother layer of tension. And I'm just sitting there not able to speak either language, and I'm like, Damn, that's crazy. When you're watching a film that's not in your native language, there's always gonna be at least a few turns of phrase here and there that subtitles alone can't convey. Things that just get lost in translation once in a while, especially in a film like this where there's an additional language barrier between the characters, and that's okay. But in this case, the performances are so good and the filmmaking is so precise that at the very least, it felt as though those tiny gaps in understanding were filled out more than usual. Park Chan-wook is another director like Luca Guadagnino who has a special talent for romance. This guy knows how to convey longing like nobody's business. See Thirst and The Handmaiden for more of that. This is very much a romance first and a murder mystery second. This film is so rich with detail, it just gets better and better with every watch, and when you've recovered from that ending, you're gonna be anxious to dive right back in. And speaking of endings that ruined my life for the better, at number three, we have After Sun. Written and directed by Charlotte Wells, After Sun is a coming-of-age film in which a woman ruminates on a significant vacation she took with her father when she was a child. This is a difficult film to describe without giving away its central themes to such a degree that it undermines how effectively subtle it is. I would hate to rob anyone of the journey of discovery you get to go on with this thing. This is an absolute masterwork of show-don't-tell to the point where it's genuinely shocking that this is Charlotte Wells' first feature-length film. It has such a trust in its audience to be able to pick up on these little pieces of visual storytelling. Just a million little things that paint such a complete picture of what's going on with these characters between the two time periods were shown in the film without ever having to say it outright. Paul Mescal and Frankie Corio give two of the best performances of the year. You very much believe that they are father and daughter. Frankie Corio's performance in the role of Sophie has, I feel, been just criminally under-talked about. She's phenomenal here, especially considering that this is her first role. Even though this is not a very dialogue-heavy film, she's able to silently get across that hopeful melancholy we all go through as preteens. There's that longing to be just slightly older than you are while not really understanding what that means, and and then you're slowly realizing that the adults around you might not have all the answers. It's a weird time. And a pretty tall order for someone who's never been in a film before. 
kid's a natural. I was glad to see Paul Mescal was at least nominated for his work in this film because to me, it was the best performance by an actor in a leading role in 2022. I'm glad Brendan won. We all love Brendan, regardless of how we feel about the film itself. We all love Brendan. However, Paul Mescal gave one of the most moving performances I have ever seen. And this is the aspect of the film that's difficult to talk about without running the risk of robbing someone of the experience. The strategic peeling back of layers concerning what's going on with this young father is just too beautifully done to spoil. What I will say is that the final 15 or so minutes of this film contain some of the most profoundly effective visual storytelling I have ever experienced. I don't know that I've ever seen anything quite like this, and I was just moved beyond words. Number two, The Banshees of Inisherin. Written and directed by Martin McDonough, The Banshees of Inisherin reunites Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson for the first time since In Bruges to bring you the breakup tale of the century. This film tells the story of Podrick and Colm, whose longtime friendship comes to a screeching halt when one day, without warning, Colm decides to end it. Shocked and distressed by this, Podrick's content little life is quickly turned upside down. If you've seen In Bruges, you know the depths of dark comedy that Martin McDonough is capable of descending into. This is definitely tied with my number one pick for favorite dialogue of the year. There is such a perfect rhythm to these exchanges, and the comedic writing is so strong that it gives the entire cast the opportunity to just play this whole thing completely straight, and the film is far funnier for it. And when it comes time for the darker elements to present themselves, it doesn't feel like this big left turn in tone. Everything flows together perfectly. This is truly dark comedy at its highest level. Colin Farrell had quite a busy 2022. There was After Yang where he plays this quiet little tea shop owner, and then he's like so good in the Batman that it's borderline unnecessary. Holy God, what are you this showing me? His head. Come on! And then in The Banshees of Inisherin, he's just absolute perfection as Podrick. He and Brendan Gleeson have an on-screen chemistry that's just flawless, I'm sure due in part to their real-life friendship that makes me dearly hope they do at least a couple more films together. Brendan Gleeson is just one of those guys that has that down-to-earth quality in his acting. He just always feels like a real guy, and sure, he'll ham it up for something like Paddington once in a while, but even then, he just has something. Just that unique presence that few actors have. He's just one of those guys that the minute he walks on screen and whatever it is you're watching, even if you don't remember his name, he will inevitably inspire the exclamation of, ah, oh, this guy, hell yeah. Carrie Condon is great in the role of Podrick's long-suffering sister Shabon, and Barry Keoghan in the role of Dominic just ripped everybody's heart out. He knocked it out of the park so hard that I cannot picture anyone else in this role. Like, it's un- real. Beautifully shot and perfectly paced, The Banshees of Inisherin as a whole feels like a fable, an old story. A tall tale your grandfather would tell you about these two fellas he used to know who just fell out. And similarly to Decision to Leave, the film is so detailed and smart that that second watch is crazy. And it would have been my number one, too. But then, Todd Field decided to give Kate Blanchett a call, and then one thing leads to another, and my number one movie of 2022 is Tar. Tar was written and directed by Todd Field and stars Kate Blanchett as a world-renowned composer by the name of Lydia Tar. I have no doubt that Tar is going to go down in history as one of the great character studies in film. There's a reason the internet loves Lydia Tar. She's endlessly fascinating and Blanchett's performance is nothing short of astounding. The story begins during a high point in Tar's career. She's a world-famous composer, conductor, EGOT winner, she's promoting an autobiography, and currently rehearsing for a live recording of Mahler's Fifth Symphony. But despite all of her power and influence, the self-involved way in which she's lived her life for so many years begins to catch up with her. Though this film takes place in the prestigious world of the Berlin Philharmonic, its approach to human behavior is very down-to-earth. Todd Field's writing never feels dishonest or out of touch at any point. Even though the film takes great care to portray the inner workings of this particular corner of the music industry as accurately as it can, it's clear that this story could take place in any organization with a clear hierarchy. It's about the moral wiggle room we give to people in power. The way that someone who has acquired the ever-coveted label of genius gets away with treating people. Tar's meditative, methodical pace isn't going to be for everyone, but I was endlessly entranced by it. Blanchett's performance is so enthralling that I was pretty dialed in at all times. 
Kate Blanchett is just an actor who is so skilled at what she does, I'm hesitant to say one thing or another is her best work because almost all of it is, but Tar is definitely up there and it may very well be my favorite, at least so far. Not only is she convincing as a musician and conductor, but also just as a person. This character is so fully formed and handled with such nuance that you come away with such a thorough understanding of who she is, and with plenty more to discover upon multiple watches. There's this through line of spirituality that's really interesting and paints an even more detailed picture of what's going on with this character internally. There are even a couple of brief moments that almost delve into the realm of horror, some of which you may not even catch the first time around. It has this atmosphere that's so hard to describe, it's not scary. It doesn't have this deep, dark, foreboding tone. It just has this slight hum of eeriness hanging underneath everything. It almost feels like somebody's behind you. Not that they're going to do anything, but they're just kind of there. Which is very fitting because one of the things that this story puts forward is the idea of being haunted. When someone is in a position of power that has cocooned them so aggressively from discomfort, when every whim of theirs is answered, does that ultimately diminish their capacity for empathy? Does someone with a god complex even have perspective enough to be humbled? And on top of all of this utter seriousness, it still manages to have that phantom thread eyes wide shut thing going on, where you kind of don't realize until you're watching it a second time that it's not just funny, it's so funny. I quote this thing all the time, it's completely taken over my brain, it's a real problem. You know, what about Beethoven? You into him? Despite all of the heavy topics presented, power, ego, abuse, separating the art from the artist, it never tells you how you're meant to feel about any of it. It's very content to let the audience think for itself, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since I first saw it. It's a masterpiece from top to bottom and a character study for the books, and it's my favorite film of 2022. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I think I'll miss you most of all, Scarecrow. Oh, also, have you seen Old Boy?